Hello everyone, this is Brian Kelly from Association Mavens, where you get direct access to some of the foremost thinkers and teachers in the association industry. My guest today is Sherry Jacobs. Sherry is the founder of Avenue M Group and is a 15-year association management veteran. As a top-rated speaker and contributor to various associations and publications, I was eager to invite Sherry to talk with me about the topic of pricing in the 21st century. Welcome to Association Mavens, Sherry. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. So I really am interested in this topic that you've been presenting on. Um, I think you just presented on um, 21st century pricing at the ASAE annual conference. And then I believe you also have an article that's coming out um, in one of the the publications on that. Um, So we'd love to talk with you a little bit about the, the situation that associations face today regarding how to price dues, programs, products, et cetera. I think, uh, you know, a lot of us may think, oh, well, you know, how much money do we need to make and we'll set the prices at this and we're good to go. But it's a lot more complex than that and especially in the current environment. So can you give us a rundown of the situation? Sure. Um, There are a few things that are going on that we all are aware of that um, are impacting our abilities to price products and sell products and market products um, or programs or services or membership or whatever it might be, um, the external uh, factors that are that are impacting our ability to do our job. Um, the obvious one that everyone knows about, of course, is um, the economy and the recession. What's interesting is that even as we start to come out of the recession and even as we all adjust to the new realities that may be here today, there's just been a change in the mindset of individuals who, whether they have enough money or not, whether they can personally afford it or their companies can afford to make purchases, whether it's purchasing a membership or a program or whatever it might be, they are scrutinizing that that decision much more closely than they ever have before. They may say, you know what, I love your product, I love your organization, I love what you do, and I have enough money to to purchase this or to join, but am I going to use it? Um, it, And and as people are thinking about that and rethinking um, how much they are using, some of the things that they used to just automatically purchase, that's impacting um, organizations to build sell, and so pricing comes in. And there are other factors as well. I mean, there's changing technology, which is changing just the distribution channels. So people have a different viewpoint in terms of, well, what am I paying for? Am I paying for the content? Am I paying for the distribution channel? You know, whether it's a magazine or is it digital? That's impacting people. Um, There's also a changing workforce. Um, And that changing workforce has different opinions and viewpoints and awareness and perceptions about the role of organizations in their professional lives. And it's just no longer an assumption that you must join or you have to be a part of this organization um, if you enter this profession. And they're asking, well, what, what have you done for me? Not what can, you know, what can I, what can I do for you? It's less of what can I do for you, but what have you done for me? So there are a variety of different things that are changing the way that organizations need to sell, and that's the situation that we're seeing that people are, are um, today, are, they have to function in. Great. Well, we'll probably get into a little bit later, but I do want to explore, um, after some of our, our next questions, um, some of the ways that you've worked with associations to, to tackle some of these challenges. Uh, so we'll revisit that in a moment. But the next thing I wanted to ask you was, um, having you talk about what some of the pricing objectives are that uh, associations should consider uh, when pulling together kind of their, their plan for, um, you know, what they're going to charge. Sure. Um, well, you know, typically uh, individuals or organizations may say, okay, we need to set the price for something. What did we charge last year? Or what did it cost? And I like to take people to have them take a step back and to first start off by thinking, what do we want to accomplish? What is our objective here? So an objective can be we need to increase demand. And demand can be we just want more people to say, you know, I want to come to the meeting, or I need that book, or I need that program, or I need that product. So increasing demand, if that's the, the objective, maybe your organization puts on a webinar and you have you sell a few seats for every webinar. And you want to increase demand for the number of people who want to attend your webinars. That's a pricing objective. Um, Another pricing objective could be we want to increase response time. 
we want to see people responding to our um, to what we're selling faster than they have in the past. This may simply be related to renewals. You're sending out renewal notices and you want people to respond you know, immediately rather than let it sit on their desk or wait to the second renewal or the third renewal. So that's another pricing objective. A third one could be um, penetrating new markets. And um, we're working with an organization that has some products that they know other um, organizations, other individuals would be interested in purchasing. They know that those individuals would be less likely to join because they're not the core audience but they want to move into this new marketplace and sell these products to them. So that could be a third objective, which is penetrating new markets. Um, and then the final two really are connected together, which is every organization, if you're mission-based, has strategic goals. And if, you're, if your goal here, if your objective to, in this pricing is to meet strategic goals, that's going to impact how you can price something. Um, and, and for some organizations, it might be standards and guidelines or things that are related to their mission that they ne can't necessarily charge a lot of money for. The other side to that pricing objective coin for this one is, you know what, we need to subsidize some of those programs that we can't charge. So a great example of that might be you might have an annual meeting that makes money and members know it makes money. Um, but your objective here might be to make a lot of money in the annual meeting because you know that either you're going to lose some money in some potential cut in um, support from different suppliers or it might be that you need to make money because that needs to help offset some of the costs for some of the mission-based activities you do such as advocacy or research or practice guidelines. So you start with what do we want to accomplish? What is the pricing objectives? And those are just some of the ones that we see. Excellent. So now let's talk about pricing sensitivities. Um, what are some of the questions that need to be asked when, when going through this process um, and, and things that folks should be aware of to, to be sensitive about? Well, once you've defined what your objective is, um, one of the first questions that, that when we work with organizations that we'll ask is, how important is this product, program, service, whatever it is, membership, for them to maintain their license or maintain their job or to earn a living? If they need to have this, it, whatever it is, in order to, um, to work, um, then there is your, your ability to your range and what you can price things is a lot greater if it is something that you would just like to have. You don't have to have this to be able to perform your job. Then you're going to see a greater price sensitivity to something. Um, another area around price sensitivity is, is it easy or difficult to compare? Um, it could be as simple as your annual meeting. You may put on an annual meeting with a selection of speakers, and those speakers are also speaking at another annual meeting within the industry. Um, if that's the case, there may be two meetings that people can choose from which they want to attend. It, your product that you're selling is easy to compare with another group. Um, on the other hand, you may create something, whether it's um, code, something around coding that's specific to your industry, or it could be um, a certification or accreditation or something else. And there isn't anything else out there that's like it. There's less price sensitivity because there isn't anything else that they can compare it to. Another area that you should look at is, does the benefit of what you're selling outweigh the cost? And that, if the benefit is tremendous um, that people are receiving for what you're selling, then again, you have a little bit more leeway. There's less price sensitivity because they absolutely love it, they want it, and that benefit is great. And then finally, an interesting one is prestige. So for anyone out there who has purchased a prestige product, it could be anything from shopping in Nordstrom or buying a coach bag or buying a certain car, those are prestige items. And so people will pay more for those luxury or prestige items. In the association world, we see that with associations selling their membership to international members. There's prestige in belonging to an American association in that industry. Hmm. When that prestige exists, you can charge more, just like some of those brands charge more. So, I mean, it seems like there, there's some really great areas that you've touched upon. And, you know, I want to 
see, without you getting into specifics, can you share a couple of uh, stories of, of some association clients that you've worked with that have been able to implement, um, you know, evaluating the objectives, looking at the pricing sensitivities, um, to, you know, to success for a particular event or, you know, membership structure, et cetera. Is there anything you can share? Sure. Um, there's a couple. One would be an organization that had an annual meeting. Um, they had made some changes to their annual meeting to really differentiate it from other industry meetings because this was in a, an industry, and it was in the healthcare field, where there are other associations that put on meetings. But they looked at a variety of different ways to differentiate it and make it different. Um, they were very uh, aware of content and not repeating content that was at other conferences. They also looked at some unique experiences and finally they wanted to bring in some really interesting and important thought leaders in the industry that weren't being that weren't being presented at other groups. So the first thing they did was they created this different meeting, but they hadn't changed their pricing, and they were undervaluing the the value. You know, they they were underpricing the value of this meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, as we went through it and we looked at this this meeting, we realized that. At, the amount of CME that people earn, and they need the CME to maintain their license, was high. And if you had priced it out, if they had taken out courses to equal the same amount, they'd be spending $2,500 just to earn the same amount of CME. Um, when we looked at the content, when we looked at the prestige associated with it, because they were looking at some new markets, going international, and they realized that, that there was prestige because that organization had that status throughout the world in this industry. Um, we thought that there could be an additional price that you can add for it. And finally, we also did some market testing. Um, and we looked at what are all the costs that are associated with attending an annual meeting. It's obviously not just registration, but there's all the other costs of travel. And what is their threshold for obtaining this and when you had to compare it to other things. And we realized they had really significantly been underpricing the meeting. Um, we put together a new pricing structure. We, we um, we looked at, we benchmarked and looked at other organizations and we understood the marketplace. Um, we compared it to other organizations and other meetings that were out there and then we did some market testing. And we found overwhelmingly that um, that new price structure that we had put in place, so it was higher than the previous one, um, not only would did we believe that there would be no drop off in the number of attendees, um, but we thought there was a big opportunity to add additional revenue to this organization. Um, since we made those recommendations, I've checked back with the organization, and they realized a quarter million dollars in additional revenue from changing this meeting. Um, that's just one example, but it's a good example of how you can wrap everything together into that. So um, with this particular organization, or maybe any of the other ones that you've worked with, um, is this something that, that they, you know, it's like a light bulb goes on when you talk with them about some of these challenges um, and also some of the ways to kind of address the issues. Um, or is it something that they're, they, they know it's kind of there, um, but, but they're looking to you to help them really figure out the nitty gritty details? You know, it, it's less of a light bulb and more of um, a process I didn't have in place with the supporting data to justify every action that they did. They didn't have a process for going through and thinking through every step. Um, and by going through this process and by really looking at absolutely everything, looking at the revenue stream, looking at the audience, looking at the marketplace, looking at their mission, understanding what they were trying to accomplish and how this would help um, other um, activities that they did, they felt that not only did it bring in additional revenue, which obviously is a great goal and an accomplishment, but more importantly, they, they really appreciated the process that we took and the ability to share this openly and be transparent with their members, with their board members, to explain why they did what they did. Um, so it, it, it really was a seamless and a smooth process um, that they could also replicate in other areas within their organization. Got it. Okay, so I've got a list here of various pricing options um, that I'll run through and, and let's explore some of these and, and, and get a greater sense of what each is. So I've got urgency, monthly versus annual, VIP, name your price, loyalty, demand, etc. The list goes on and on. There's all different types of pricing. So um, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just touch upon a, a few of them um, and, and, and expound a little bit more on what each of these means. Sure. Well, one that came to mind was urgency. Um, and 
I, I think back to the day when I first started in the industry and we used to um, design, print, mail um, our brochures, our marketing materials. We had an early bird deadline that was maybe six weeks after we mailed it because they needed all that time to consider it, respond, mail in a check, complete a form, yeah. and mail it back. Um, it, the times have changed dramatically. Technology has changed response times, and there, has, there needs to be a new sense of urgency that doesn't always exist within organizations that are still wedded to the old way of creating just simple early bird deadlines and giving lots of lead time. Um, the, the obvious one that we all think about is um, special offers that come in where you have 24 hours to respond and you get a special discount. And what that does is it creates some urgency. You only have 24 hours if you want to get it and there's a special offer that you get. That kind of urgency pricing can be done by organizations. We've helped organizations do it around their webinars. Um, but you can do it around anything um, where you put in a very short deadline, maybe 12 hours or 24 hours, make the deadline 11.59 um, p.m. At, on Thursday um, to get this special discount. Um, and we've seen tremendous response when you create that urgency and that special offer that's combined with it. Great. Uh, some of the other um, uh, pricing options that I've thought about are monthly versus annual. A lot of organizations are still um, using an annual membership um, to sell, where you join for an entire year and you're billed once a year for that. Um, that doesn't necessarily work for individuals who either want to try something out and aren't ready to commit fully to it, or um, that monthly fee may be a, a bit, a bit high for them initially and if it's broken down on a monthly basis it may be something that's more budget friendly um, and you have to, again it goes back to what audiences are you trying to attract and what's your goal here um, but that monthly versus annual is a new way to think about how you could do not just membership but also potentially other products subscriptions magazines um, book publications or other things that you offer um, one of the last ones that um, we've been talking with groups about is a new option called VIP. And um, sometimes organizations think, okay, well, I can have this price or maybe I'll offer a discount to get people in the door. And an alternative way to look at it is to actually charge more. So you have your base price and then you charge more and you give more for that. I've seen that with some groups that did it around their education programs where everybody, anyone, it doesn't matter your category, or the time you come in, but everybody pays one base fee. But if you would like some additional benefits, maybe priority seating, maybe special cocktail reception with some um, key content leaders, or um, maybe it's something as simple as uh, you know a special registration area and signed publications or books from, from um, keynote speakers. Um, packaging all that together and making a special offer for your VIPs. Um, anybody can be a VIP if they want to pay a little bit more for it. So it's a new revenue stream, but it also gives a new experience to, to members. Have you found that with this VIP option that, that people are, are really interested in, in being able to get kind of that more um, exclusive access to additional content or, um, you know, some of the other things that you named? Is, is that something that appeals to a lot of folks? We are seeing that. It. Um, it, it's been done in, in a limited uh, way. Um, we only know of a couple of our organizations that um, that are using it, but those organizations have reported that there's very little downside to offering it. So if people didn't take advantage of it, there's very little investment on their part or any loss that would be if they created this VIP program. But what they found is that they were selling out, that they created a limited number of VIP opportunities and that people were taking advantage of them and they were selling out these VIP opportunities. And when, they've, when we have or they have spoken with the individuals who took advantage of it, they were all thrilled with the opportunity to get more if they were willing to pay more. Yeah, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Okay, so the, the last one that I was kind of curious about um, talking with you in regards to is name your price. So a lot of us are familiar with um, you know, things like Priceline where you go in and you say, well, I'm going to pay this much and we'll see what happens. Um, have, you, have you done anything with that specifically? Um, in the association realm, um, and if so, you know, what does something like that look like? We're working with two organizations that we're exploring it right now, and the re part of the reason we're doing that is 
um, there's there is a move towards customization and um, don't don't give me things that and make me pay for things that I don't use or I'm not interested in. Mm -hmm. um, it, this actually conversation has been going on for a long time. Sometimes people complain about it that a la carte. Um, in fact, the airline industry has moved to that a la carte. Um, but there's a sense that now they're nickel and diming me for everything. Yeah. So it's a very interesting area to move into. On the one hand, you're trying to customize it, and you don't name your price, and you decide what you want. We'll give you a base price and a base membership, and everything additional you can choose and pay for, and that seems very customized. But the flip side to that is, why am I being nickel and dimed for all these other things? It's very difficult to find that right sweet spot right in the middle there, um, and organizations are, we're just exploring that. I, I don't feel like we have the answer to that one yet. But I think that as long as you try things and that you explore things, then you can find out, will this work for us? And why or why not will this work? And what do we need to do to make it work? Yeah, absolutely. Well, very interesting. So we talked about you know some, some of these tactical things. Now I want to take a step back and, and let's talk a little bit more bigger picture. When um, talking about pricing, um, I've, I've heard you say that it's important to consider the audience when defining the value. Why is this important? Um, you know, why is this something that we need to be thinking about um, instead of just the bottom line number? Well, the audience, um, you can spend a lot of money and bring somebody in, but if they come in and you don't have what they're interested in, they will quickly leave. And that lifetime value of that person is not only very low, but your acquisition costs can be very, very high. And you find out you have a low retention rate. Um, so it's very important for you to define, and we do this with an asset audit, but it's to define what do you have and is it a low, medium, or high driver of membership? Is it something that people place a low, medium, or high value on? What's interesting is it could be the same products, but for different audits, Going to be different. The perfect example is if you're a bar association, you have some members who find tremendous value and must, for, for their sake of their business, have uh, networking opportunities and potentially different kinds of continuing legal education. Mm -hmm. You have other types of attorneys, and this might be the government attorneys, who don't need to have that kind of networking, and maybe they get their CLE through the government and at their office. So the same items have lower or higher value depending on the audience. When you are pricing these products and you're trying to market it to them, if you price it all and you, and you package it all in the same way to every single audience, um, you may find that some may respond, whereas others, you have very low response rates. It may have nothing to do with your marketing tactics or with you know, the channels that you use or, your mess or the messaging and have everything to do with what you've packaged and how you've priced it mm. because of value first. Right. So kind of the next step, you know, beyond that is like making sure that this is done before determining the cost. Um, you know, I think you touched on, upon it a little bit, but, you know, why is this important for us to, to identify this and, and define the value first before, um, you know, we, we put a, a final price on something? Sure. Um, well, if you start off with what does it cost us to produce and let's, you know, mark this up slightly, um, then what you're doing is, is cost-based pricing. And you're saying, well, I'm going to assign value just basically based on what does it cost to create it. Um, by doing that, you have a very low likelihood of succeeding in selling a lot because you haven't to thoroughly analyzed what it truly is the value of that. Um, because it could be that the value is equal to the cost, or it could be that the value is considerably more than the cost. Um, and it can go both ways. If you start off with what is the value of something, and what would be people be willing to pay for this, and why do they need it, um, and then assign a cost to it, you have a high, much higher likelihood of succeeding, which may be selling more products, getting more members, engaging more people, and having them satisfied with what they purchased and the price they paid for it. Uh, one great example of that is as we look at the, um, how things are becoming uh, more digital, um, whether it's public, a publication, maybe you have a magazine or a journal, and 
this publication has always come out in print and the cost to distribute it can be very high. And you look at the cost and you send the value. Now, let's say that you've taken one of your publications and you've turned it into a digital publication. The cost may have gone down dramatically, but the value is in the content. It's not necessarily in that I actually have a paper magazine that's in front of me. So just because the costs have gone down doesn't mean in this case that you should lower the, the price for it because the value hasn't decreased. And it can work the opposite way as well. But that's why you start with what is the value of something, what is it worth to the different audience segments rather than what is the cost. Great. Well, I couldn't agree more. Some really great um, thought-provoking uh, items here, Sherry. So thank you so much for, for doing the interview. And thanks to everybody for watching. Be sure to sign up today in the upper right corner of this website to be updated via email when new interviews are posted. Also, follow at Brian Kelly now on Twitter to stay on top of all things Association Mavens related. Lastly, please submit your recommendation for which Association Maven you'd like to see interviewed next. Thanks again for watching, and I look forward to bringing you some more great interviews. Until next time, bye bye.